lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Trees are the gentle giants of our gardens, and today we are so fortunate to learn from master arborist and beloved industry expert, Rex Bastian. Trees are essential to life. They give us oxygen, they anchor the soil, they provide shelter, and store carbon. In the garden, they provide so very much, yet many gardeners often feel unsure about their trees, unsure of how to properly care for them, unsure of how or when to prune them. And when problems arise, we can be at a loss for how to best help our trees. Yes, there is much to learn about trees, but today's guest, Rex Bastian, will share some insights and practical tips that will get you started on a path toward better tree stewardship. And that's something that benefits not only our trees, but our gardens, our wildlife, our communities, our health, and even the future. Trees. Caring for the Garden's Gentle Giants with Rex Bastian. That's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community and this week's Garden News Roundup. Well, first, I'd like to start out by saying thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week, especially if you've just found the show, a special welcome to you, and then welcome back to any returning listeners. I'm a huge advocate of listening to gardening podcasts as a way to grow and learn, so I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you're loading up your playlist and listening to lots of different podcasts every single week. With this podcast in particular, there is a Facebook group, a listener community that you can join. It's completely free. All you have to do is type in the name of our group into the search bar. Just search for the Still Growing Podcast group, and the listener community community will just show up at the top in the search results. In fact, just the other day I was checking this and I just typed in still growing and the group popped up. So you don't have to type in too much. It should just pop right up and then just request to join. Now, the reason I'd like you to join the group is that you get so many great benefits. First, I do a lot of work every week to curate good gardening articles for you to read. So that's available to you. Second, the Facebook group is the only place that I go to pick lucky listeners for any of our giveaways from our guests and sponsors. Third, you get to interact with those guests that have been on the show. And finally, there is no spam in the group. The content that I post that others share is spam free. It's very high quality. I work very hard to make sure that the group is helpful and that the content is worthwhile for you. So everything I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. With that, I'd like to welcome new members to the group, Craig LaHoulier. Of course, Craig was just on episode 587. He's the author of Epic Tomatoes. Deborah Anderson Laterza, Angela Flippings, Christina Schaefer Rocco, Patty Lou Lauer, Brittany Amon, Sandra Orr, Judy Homa Ronan, Rita Merringer, Andrea Elmer, Maureen Bonas, and David Douglas. Welcome, you guys. Well, there were a number of hot topics in the listener community this week. Julie Heinen posted a great question. She said, as the season is coming to a close here in Minnesota, I'm anxious to start planning my garden for next year. Does anyone have any recommendations for seed catalogs I should request? I'm looking for both vegetables and flowers, preferably heirloom varieties available to grow in zone 4A. So here were some of the suggestions. Baker Creek, of course. Michigan Gardener. Old House Gardens Heirloom Bulbs. Prairie Moon Nursery. Marine Bonas pointed out that you can order native wildflower seeds through the Brandywine Conservancy. So she shared that link as well. 
Katya Swift, who's going to be joining me on an upcoming episode, shared high mowing seeds and Fedco seeds, of course. Past guest Megan Kane likes Johnny seeds and, of course, seed savers in addition to high mowing seeds. And Quick Page shared botanical interests because, of course, they're very affordable and their seed packets contain so much information. Anyway, lots of great suggestions and conversation around seed catalogs in the group this week. Another thing that I thought was pretty interesting was something that was shared by Listener Advisory Board member Patricia Chandler Newport. Here's what she wrote. Crazy thing happened in my garden. I have a berry patch, raspberry, blackberry, strawberry, and gooseberry, and noticed about a month ago there was a yellow jacket nest under the roots of my gooseberry. I'm allergic. I was kind of waiting it out until a hard frost and then was going to ask my husband to go dig the nest out. Anyway, I went out there to check on the situation a couple of days ago. This was at the end of October. And she found a basketball-sized hole dug underneath the gooseberry, and the nest was in pieces all over the ground in a pretty wide area with no wasps to be seen. Patricia wrote, if I'm not mistaken, a skunk may have been my fairy godmother here. Nature is so strange sometimes. Then Danny Perkins chimed in and said, I had no idea yellow jackets could be a meal for something. Cindy Baldwin said that skunks were tearing up her yard every night. Beth Engel said that either skunk or raccoon could have taken care of that yellow jacket nest. She wrote she had a bumblebee nest in her compost pile that they took care of one year. Then listener Michael Todd Pierce said, Mike McGrath mentioned that skunks will dig up and eat yellow jacket nests on his show. So good job, Michael, because I always say, listen to those gardening podcasts. And Michael Todd Pierce was correct. And Mike, Mike McGrath is correct. In fact, if you just Google skunks eat yellow jackets, the first thing that comes up is a WordPress website talking about mammal behavior. And it says this, skunks dig up yellow jackets and ground wasp nests to eat both larvae and adults. They have even been known to agitate a nest and swat down adults as they emerge and eat them. Striped skunks seem to be immune or highly resistant to yellow jacket venom, but some skunks have died from bee stings. And this was published in 2013. So anyway, I thought that was a very interesting topic of discussion in the group this week. So file it away for future reference. Skunks eat yellow jacket nests. Well, there were many beautiful pictures of listeners' gardens this week in the group. Robert Baxter shared pictures of his New Orleans garden, which is so lush and so gorgeous. He's got a beautiful bottle tree on this path that's leading, looks like, to the front door of his property. Just gorgeous. Christopher Yoder shared what a great year he's had in his garden. He uploaded a couple of pictures from this year's project. It was his first home. They had to sacrifice on space, he wrote, but he wouldn't sacrifice the garden. And I love that. I love seeing pictures from a first-year garden, just seeing the transformation. And those are pictures that Christopher will be going back to time and time again as he continues to improve his garden with each passing year. I was super impressed with listener John Brian Silverio, who shared a most amazing picture from his garden. It's actually his design plans, and he is meticulous. His post was about planting garlic for the first time, and he also had recently covered his raised beds with crimson clover for some cover cropping. Karen Tandy shared a beautiful image from the end of October. This was on October 25th. There was a beautiful sunset happening. And Karen Tandy caught a gorgeous fall sunset. It was absolutely pink. And what she did is she shared a picture with the group of not only this beautiful sunset, but then of all of the beautiful pink blooming flowers that were still having a party in her garden. 
So her theme was pink, and it was gorgeous. Patricia Chandler Newport got an orchid when she was at Trader Joe's right before Halloween. And Patricia said when she bought it, she said it reminded her of black spiders. And she was wondering what kind of orchid it was. And I was looking at it and I'm thinking, hmm, if I was a plant explorer, what would I call this orchid? And right away I thought, I think I'd call it a spider orchid. Wouldn't you know? That's what it's called, a spider orchid. Listener Danny Perkins shared an absolutely stunning photo of the leaves on his oak leaf hydrangea because not only were they this beautiful red as we were heading into fall here at the end of October, but they almost looked, he said, reptilian, and I'm thinking almost like a leather couch. That's what they reminded me of. And this was interesting because as other people started sharing what their oak leaf hydrangea leaves looked like, there was so much diversity. So depending on where you garden, you can get a myriad of results. And one plant is not going to grow the same or put on the same display in your garden as it will in another. Such a great reminder of that. Even Danny commented on his picture, on his oak leaf hydrangea. He said, I've not noticed the texture of my oak leaf hydrangea looking like this before. I loved what Spencer Holdley shared with his garden. He also had a garden that he was just starting on. And he showed a before picture where he said it was overrun with mint, rotting wood, and completely overrun with iris. But it's now cleaned up, thinned out, and come spring, it's going to be filled with flowers, anything he can get his hands on and grow from seed. And honestly, Spencer, when I saw this image, I immediately was thinking of a crevice garden. Because even just the shape of this garden echoes so strongly this really beautiful crevice garden that Jan Johnson had featured in her book, The Spirit of Stone. So if you get a chance to check that out, see what you think. I think you might have a natural crevice garden in the making there. And then finally, I had to chuckle. Bernadette Ward brought in her huge 55-gallon tropicals inside for the winter once again. And now she's got these 18-month-old grandsons that are living with her. And they're, of course, getting into the plants and getting into the dirt. So she solved the issue by finding three giant floor scrubber pads And so she had these foam pads cut to fit the inside of the containers, and then she laid that over the soil so that her little grandsons couldn't get into the pots. And I like the solution. They're breathable. It's a harmless barrier. It's inert. And the pads are soft and flexible. So as her tropical trees are coming up out of the soil, they're not getting strangled by these foam pads. So ingenious solution, Bernadette. In listener love, I want to make sure I thank one more time listener Lisa Lane for sharing images of her seeds. I put out the call to get images for seeds and Lisa responded with many different images. And one of her images was used to make the album cover for episode 590. And it's How to Save Seed with Cheryl Moore Goff. So that image is thanks to listener Lisa Lane. And then also in listener love, Mara Palaise wrote in that she was so inspired by the podcast featuring Kylie Baumley on how to save the monarch that she decided to incorporate a few species of milkweed into her new cutting and now butterfly garden. And she had an interesting question. She said, I could sow seeds, but with so much else to do, I thought I would go the easier route and buy plants. Fortunately, a nursery near me sells several varieties in four-inch pots, but due to California's agricultural regulations, these plants have been treated with BT. So her question was, if I buy these BT-treated plants, do I risk harming monarch larva or any other caterpillar larva? And also... 
is the use of BT in general harmful to butterflies? Well, Kylie Bomley, who is in the listener group, replied right away. And she said, first of all, I'm thrilled the podcast inspired you. And then she said, now for the news about BT and monarchs. Kylie said, it really upsets me when the garden centers use anything on their milkweed. I mean, most people buy milkweed for the monarchs. So why do they use it? Generally, it's so that their plants look good for their customers, meaning none of the leaves will be chewed on. BT is meant to kill caterpillars, including monarch caterpillars. Mara lives in California, and yes, they're migrating, but there will always be some overlap of migratory and non-migratory monarchs. People are still finding caterpillars and even eggs in places far north of where the monarchs should be right now. This unreasonably warm weather has extended the migration both in time and in breadth, but no, the answer is no to BT. And then one other side note that Kylie mentioned here. She said, this is the very thing that I'm talking about when I warn people that just because it's organic or natural doesn't mean it's harmless. A pesticide is a pesticide, whether it's organic or not. Great point, Kylie. Well, if you have questions for the show, you can always contact the show with this phone number, 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. Feel free to reach out with your questions or comments, suggestions or feedback for the show. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments, from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with. And that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. Now, what's nice about all of this for you is that you can stay pretty informed about the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated posts and articles for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. All right, let's kick things off with a guest update. Past guest Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zinni shared her November gardening chores, and Jen does this every single month. She shares a comprehensive gardening chores list, and so her November post was out as of November 1st, and as Jen wrote, winter is coming. Yay! (laughs) Sarcasm. Anyway, if you're looking for a good garden chores list, head on over to Frau Zenny. Then Megan Kane featured in episode 557. She's the Wisconsin Creative Vegetable Gardener. She shared a number of great posts. The first was how to delight in more food this fall by beating the first frost. And here, of course, she's talking about using things like row cover and Rime to protect tender plants this fall. She also shared a great post on how to store your beet harvest for winter. And I love what she wrote here. What if I told you that there's really no such thing as too many beets? Would you believe me? In a nutshell, what Megan does to store her beets is she snips off the greens from the tops and then puts the beets in plastic bags. And a key thing that Megan reminds all of us to do is not to wash the beets, not to wipe the soil off or wash them. Because that waxy layer on beets, just like that waxy layer on carrots, is protective and is a preservative. It keeps them from rotting. 
So don't clean them off until you're ready to use them. Anyway, you can get all of the information, all of the suggestions and ideas that Megan has around safely storing beets over the winter by heading over to her website at creativevegetablegardener.com. In sustainability this week, the Practical Herbalist shared a great post about apples, reminding us that apples are nature's bandage. And it's easy to forget about this when we talk about herbs so much. We sometimes forget about the healing properties and the medicinal properties of fruits and vegetables. But apples definitely have medicinal properties. In fact, this article reminded me that apples are also great for upset stomachs. They can soothe tummy aches. And I remember when the kids were little, I would give them applesauce. Happy to be reminded of the healing power of apples. I like to keep those types of tips top of mind. And you can check this article out for future reference. Just head on over to the group and in the search bar, type apple. In Continuing Ed, garden experts Thompson and Morgan had a great post. This was in the middle of October, and they reviewed nine wonderful Welsh garden bloggers. So if you enjoy reading garden blogs, you will love these gorgeous, beautifully created Welsh garden blogs. Check out that list. Then also in Continuing Ed, the homestead lady had a great post that was called Moldy Tomatoes, No Problem, Save Seeds. It's another reminder that sometimes when our tomatoes start to go bad before we can get a chance to eat them, we can still salvage the seeds from those tomatoes. There were a couple of great posts in the How To DIY segment The first was from thegardenglove.com, and they shared a great post on how to make winter garden planters. And of course, that's something we're all working on right now. They had a beautiful planter incorporating red cabbage. And even just going through this post is such a good reminder that the best winter planters have a combination of not only living plants and natural materials but other complementary items as well. So get creative about the containers that you use. In this post, they shared a number of rustic and natural containers, things that that had been repurposed. And don't forget to incorporate things like twigs, berries, and branches. A lot of times, I will just forage for those things on my walks with Sunny. And you can do the same. The Telegraph shared a post called How to Store Autumn Fruit and Vegetables to Last All Winter. This post reminded me of what Barbara Pleasant said to do in her book, Homegrown Pantry, and that was to store carrots and beets in wet sand because it fools the carrots and the beets into thinking that they're still growing outside since they're a biennial. They think they're just chilling out, waiting to bloom once spring comes. When I shared this post in the group, my mom saw it, and when my folks came over for Emma's confirmation this past weekend, they commented and they said, did you know your grandmother did that? She had containers of wet sand in the basement, that's how she always stored her carrots and her beets. And then I asked Phil's folks, and their parents did the same thing. Then finally, in the how-to DIY segment, Southern Living shared this adorable DIY wreath, and it's made completely with terracotta pots. Terracotta pots are so warm and inviting. I have my own large collection of them, and anytime I see them repurposed in a new way, I fall in love with them all over again. But this terracotta pot wreath, I really, really liked And one of the things they did with the terracotta pots is they fashioned them into this wreath using wire, of course, and they used some deco art snow text to kind of age the pots. Now, I've done this in the past using lime, but no matter what you use, whether you age the pots or not, this is a fun craft for using terracotta pots. In the plant spotlight, there was a great post that was from Sissinghurst Castle, a WordPress blog, and this one was devoted to asters. 
And the introduction to this blog post made me chuckle. Let me read this to you. Asters have a perpetual habit in late summer, much like the ever popular snowdrop in winter. They are the plant on every gardener's lips and are the topic for most horticultural magazines and newspaper articles. What amazes me most about them is their sudden appearance. You won't hear a mention of the A word throughout most of the year. If it happens to slip out, it can cause a slight shudder amongst gardeners with a reminder that autumn is coming and that the season is drawing to a close. Lo and behold, Although expected, their sudden arrival is always a surprise. Shutter or not, I thought this was a great post on asters. I included it in the plant spotlight. And I also included a post from Gail Eichelberger over at Clay and Limestone. She created a very lovely post, and what I really liked about it was she focused on the fall-blooming supportive players for her wildlife-friendly garden. In this post, she featured her African blue basil. I'm a huge fan of African blue basil. Other people in the group commented on that as well. She mentioned another one of my favorites, pineapple sage. Can't get enough pineapple sage every single spring. And then, of course, salvia. So three great plants featured in her post. And again, that's over on her website, clayandlimestone.com. Finally, in the plant spotlight, I've been seeing blue ballet squash everywhere on social media. So I finally shared a picture of it that I'd seen on Twitter. And when I shared it in the group, I said, this is making my list for my 2018 garden. Now, sometimes when I see blue ballet squash on social media, people can doctor up the images to try to make it look a little bluer than it really is. But the picture that I shared, I think is pretty true. And it's still plenty blue. So if you're looking for a novelty item to have in your garden next year, try Blue Ballet Squash. In the news this week, Adele turned down a $1 million private gig to read her garden. I loved sharing that with the group. There was a stunning post from Learner.org that was covering the arrival of the monarchs at the sanctuaries in Mexico. And a monarch watcher wrote, A harmonious parade of monarchs were streaming across the sky. I have not seen such a massive arrival in years. So a great year for the monarchs. In fact, Jeffrey Kent wrote an exclusive column for Lux. It was his first column. And the article that he wrote was on the most extraordinary wonders of the natural world. And the monarch butterfly migration made this list. If you'd like to read this article or see all of the wonderful photos and the other wonders listed, just head on over to the Facebook group and type in wonder. Also in monarch news, San Antonio hosts a monarch butterfly and pollinator festival Every year, it's in the last week or so of October, and they shared images from this year's festival. They have a big parade. They do a butterfly release. They've got all kinds of educational events. And Monarch Watch's Dr. Chip Taylor was on hand to lead a butterfly walk and a talk at the San Antonio Botanical Garden. So a great event. If you happen to be in San Antonio at the end of October, you might want to check that out. Finally in the news, the Oxford Botanical Garden is getting folks excited about growing the world's largest flower there. It's called the Raphelsia. And to create excitement about this beautiful Asian plant, they created a giant model of it so that people could get a sense for how large this flower is on this plant. And then part of creating social proof and excitement around this, the Botanical Garden is asking people to share selfies alongside the plant using the hashtag Raphelsian Oxford. So go ahead and check that out the next time you're on social media if you'd like to get a sense for the world's largest flower. In the Dream Guest segment is Ashley Woodson Bailey. 
She's a botanical artist and photographer. And this article gave us a chance to peek inside her studio. And I'm also a huge fan of her wallpaper. Her photography is just absolutely amazing. And then I found this interesting. Her post-editing process includes a program that's called Afterlight. Here's what she says. I use a program called Afterlight to apply a series of filters and layers. I just spend hours refining them to get them into a hazy, smoky, soft place. In the beginning, I actually tried shooting with a giant, fancy digital camera, but the iPhone gets a softer look that is more my language. So if you're an iPhone photographer, you're in good company because Ashley Woodson Bailey is as well. There were a number of great posts in science this week that were very fitting for Halloween at the end of the month. The first was showing how parasitic wasps do major damage to caterpillars. This post was a little gruesome to look at with all of the pictures, but it was very informative. So if you're not familiar with parasitic wasps, take a second and read through that post. Then LiveScience.com shared an image of the demon orchid, where when you look at this orchid, you look at the center of it, it looks like a devil head and it has claw-like petals. That was perfect for Halloween as well. Also in science, the Royal Society of Chemistry on Twitter shared an excellent infographic on the color of various leaves and the chemistry behind it. And then finally, there was an interesting article about Japanese artist Makoto Azuma, who sent a bouquet of flowers 30,000 meters into space and then photographed that bouquet. And it looked super cool. So there among the stratosphere, kind of the edge of the world, you can see the earth in the background and the black sky of space. Right in between both of those things was this beautiful bouquet just floating in space. That made for a very cool picture. In Shopping This Week was a great post by Jane Perrone over at Gardenista, and she shared her guide to getting first dibs on the best IKEA houseplants. And apparently, there are four times every single year when it really is the best time to go to Ikea for houseplants. And those months are February, April, August, and October, because that's when they put new plant introductions on the shelves. In recipes this week, homesteadhoney.com shared a great post called Braised Turnips and Apples Recipe. This was a recipe that she adapted from finecooking.com. And this is actually something that she's made for Thanksgiving. So check that out. Just search for turnips when you're in the Facebook group. Eatingwell.com shared a fun post called How to Hassleback Any Vegetable Like a Pro. And if you don't know what a hassleback is... The idea is simple. You just take a vegetable and then you cut a bunch of thin slices crosswise and that's hasslebacking any vegetable. Just make sure you don't cut all the way through. That's the key. So this article shared how to hassleback a zucchini, how to hassleback a potato, and so on and so forth. The great thing about cutting all of those slices is that you get to stuff them with your favorite flavorings. So one of the examples they gave was hasslebacking a tomato, and in between each of the slices, as it kind of fanned out, they inserted a slice of mozzarella cheese and a leaf of basil. What a beautiful idea. Then SOS Vegetarian Life shared a great post called Whole Roasted Cauliflower. I've been seeing so many cauliflower recipes. And what I liked about this one is that you just keep the cauliflower intact. Now, a lot of people, when they do their whole roasted cauliflower, put yogurt on top. But in this post, the author used chickpea flour and cashews. And that turned out well. And by the way, it's beautiful, a whole roasted cauliflower. So if you haven't seen that, Check that out. Just head on over to the Facebook group and type in cauliflower. In inspiration, I shared an image of a ghosty little succulent. 
It's Haworthia obtusa variegata. It truly looks like a succulent that's turned into a ghost. It's absolutely white, almost iridescent. That was beautiful. And then finally, an inspiration was a post about the 100 most influential urbanists. This was fantastic because it shared 100 stories of people that are doing great work in urban areas all across the country. And in many cases, this work involves planting and creating garden spaces in unlikely spots. So I love this post. Very inspiring. And then finally, there was a post that was featured in Culture. And this post featured seven paintings that captured the beauty of Polish autumn, beautiful landscapes in these pictures, and that's why they made the inspiration segment this week. In Quotables this week is a poem written by Sylvia Plath. It's called Poppies in October, and this poem has been called a faultless poem by famed poetry critic Helen Vendler. The poem has always been well-received by critics, but it's not as popular with casual readers, and it's often overlooked among the late masterpieces that formed her collection, Ariel. Anyway, even though we've just crept into November, I wanted to make sure that I shared Sylvia Plath's Poppies in October. Even the sun clouds this morning cannot manage such skirts, nor the woman in the ambulance whose red heart blooms through her coat so astoundingly. A gift, a love gift, utterly unasked for by a sky palely and flammily igniting its carbon monoxides, by eyes dulled to a halt under bowlers. Oh my God, what am I that these late mouths should cry open in a forest of frosts, in a dawn of cornflowers? Well, that's the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, trees, caring for the garden's gentle giants with Rex Bastian. I learned so much from my chat with Rex, and I wanted to give you a preview of some of the things that I learned from Rex that I think are particularly valuable insights to help you take better care of the trees in your garden. Now, when you hear Rex talk about these in the interview, you'll know to pay particularly close attention to these key points. First, trees don't heal. They seal off. So when there is a wound or a problem, that's how trees respond. It's their way. Sealing, not healing. Second, trees shed branches and leaves to make handling their large mass more manageable. This is something we need to be more aware of as we become better monitors of our trees and their health. Third, Trees must grow. They are committed to increasing their mass. If they stop growing, they die. We've all seen Russian nesting dolls and the rings on trees, and trees grow like those Russian nesting dolls, adding a whole layer to the tree every single year. So whether they are growing fast or slow, it doesn't matter. It only matters that they grow. And in the world of trees, it's grow or die. Fourth, the decline spiral of trees can be stopped if it's caught early enough. So knowing your trees and monitoring them is very important. And then finally, the phenomenon that occurs every single fall when the leaves on the trees change their colors and fall off is awe-inspiring. But the science behind it is often misunderstood. 
Many people think that the cool weather alone causes leaves to change color, but actually, the lengthening of nighttime hours, increasing darkness, is the most influential factor among many. And I find as gardeners, we always underestimate the power of light and darkness when it comes to plants and their behaviors. Now, let me share a little bit of information about today's guest. Rex Bastian is a technical advisor for the Davy Tree Expert Company, and he recently received a 2017 Award of Distinction from the International Society of Arboriculture or the ISA. Now, Rex was honored with the ISA's Award of Merit in 2017. It's the ISA's highest honor for outstanding service in advancing the principles, ideas, and practices of arboriculture. Jim Zwack, General Manager of the Davy Institute, the Davy Company's premier research development and innovation division, says this about Rex. Rex has a unique combination of breadth, and depth of subject matter expertise, and it's difficult to find a topic for which he lacks a qualified opinion. He masterfully combines an enthusiastic teaching style with years of wisdom accrued by observing and assessing the plant healthcare services we provide for clients. Rex started with the care of trees in 1989, and he joined Davy in 2008 when the care of trees merged with Davy. Rex works as the regional technical advisor with emphasis on education and training and diagnostics. He holds a PhD in entomology from Iowa State University, and he's an ISA certified master arborist. Rex is getting ready to retire later this year, so I'm thrilled I got the chance to speak with him before he starts this next chapter in his life. Rex has influenced and educated thousands of people over his career, and I'm so thrilled that he gets the chance to make a difference yet again with the listeners of the Still Growing Podcast. Without further ado, here's Rex Bastian. Well, hello, Rex, and welcome to the Still Growing Podcast. Good morning, Jennifer. Glad to be here. Today, we're talking about things that listeners can be doing right now to do their final tree inspection and to learn about things that can help them identify issues or potential issues with their trees as they head into the back half of the year. This is a really great time to pay attention to your trees as the leaves start to drop. You can really see what's going on with your trees. That's right. Yep. This is a great time uh, just for, for that reason. I know it may be getting a little bit late in the season for some parts of the country, but uh, other parts of the country, you know, we're, we're coming into the fall season. And so uh, as the leaves fall, being able to see the structure and the branching patterns of the tree is just a, it's just a great time to be looking up rather than down. Share with us some of your tree whispering skills, some of the things that you've learned over the years, things that you look for right away when you're inspecting a tree. Well, when we, we first look at a tree, we always look and, you know, you, you get an assessment of its size and kind of its, its health, where the tree is growing. Uh, we usually do a cursory inspection of the tree just to make sure there are no large defects. Unfortunately, trees can be like young children sometimes, and they can develop poor habits when they're young. And if they're not corrected, they just magnify as the tree grows. So one of our, always our first concern as arborists is always looking at a tree and assessing its structural stability. And that can be different than the tree's actual health, if that kind of makes sense. Oh, that's interesting. So you've kind of got two tracks that you're going down here. Yeah, it is, because the tree's health, a tree can actually be very healthy, but structurally unsound. And that comes from how trees grow. Trees can't 
seal defects, they seal them off and they actually add new wood each year to the tree. So trees can have many internal defects that they just try to cover up with, with new wood. And they can be successful uh, at that or sometimes, you know, not so successful. Interesting. So there potentially could be trees that you or that most people would look at and say, oh, that tree is fine. And you're looking at and you're identifying maybe an area where something's healed over and you know it's a potential issue. Yes. uh, You know, it's telling if a tree is structurally sound. We have guidelines that we work with, but it's not an exact science. Uh, Wood is very flexible. Uh, You have internal cavities and things going on inside of the tree that we we can't see with our two eyes. Uh, Sometimes by how a tree uh, grows, uh, trees have something called, we we learn about, as arborists, we learn about the body language of trees. So trees give us hints to what's going on inside of them by looking at visual cues on the outside of the tree. So arborists kind of are skilled in that particular language. So we often notice things that the lay person just doesn't you know, pay any attention to. Hmm. You know, this time of year, we just went through, you know, the change of seasons in Minnesota. It's very abrupt this year. We're not even to Halloween and already we're having snow and sleet and freezing cold temperatures, terrible wind. And I was just outside winterizing my lawnmower as the snow is falling all around me. And I was thinking about the conversation that I had with my neighbor the other day as they were carting all the leaves off their property, blowing leaves off and and then just removing them off their property. They were asking me, why do trees lose their leaves in the fall? And I'd love to have you answer that question. A lot of leaf drop in the fall is triggered by the change in in day length. And and actually, rather than the the shortening of the daytime, it's actually the increasing nighttime length that the trees tend to recognize. So, and it's kind of a safety mechanism to make sure that, uh, you know, as the days get shorter and the nights longer, that the trees begin to prepare themselves for that change in temperature. And and really, we don't like to see these real rapid changes from really mild to really cold because just like, you know, us, you know, it seems like once we get into winter, we're a little bit used to those, you know, for the cold temperatures that if when they arrive first in the, in the fall, they always seem a lot colder than they seem to be in January. So, the triggering is is actually the trees can sense the changing day length and they prepare uh, themselves accordingly. And that's why we see the fall colors, because as the trees kind of realize or sense that the days are getting longer, the days are getting longer, the nights shorter, they begin to decrease their chlorophyll production. And that's the chemical that we see that uh, is responsible for the trees appearing green. So as the chlorophyll wanes, some of the other pigments, the browns, the yellows, and some of the oranges begin to show up. Now the the colors that really make a fall season, which are the reds and purples, they're actually created uh, in the fall. They don't exist in the plants usually, and so they're actually created in the fall. So uh, nice Uh, bright sunny days and cool nights with uh, adequate soil moisture and and sugars in the leaves are the keys that tend to make the red pigments in those species of trees that form red pigments and purple pigments and that of course is what really sets off any given fall season are those are those uh, reds and purples and how intense they are compared to the other fall colors. Hmm. So that that change in daylight is what triggers that pigment creation in those reds and purple trees. That's 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 right. The chlorophyll begins to decrease uh, naturally, and then some of the other pigments show up. And then, if the conditions are are favorable, uh, then those those red and purple pigments will be more pronounced than they might be in some other years where the conditions 
maybe less so favorable for their development, such as cloudy uh, days or conditions that would blow off a lot of the leaves, so wet, rainy weather that knocks the leaves off rather than leaving them on the tree so they can form the color. Yeah. You know, I did a little experiment inadvertently this year. I have a beautiful locust tree in my front yard, and I love it because I get dappled sun under it so I can plant under it. I have a big planter, and I I really love Mm -hmm. this tree. It's got a beautiful shape to it. Just looks like a grand old locust tree. And what I've noticed over the years is we have a sprinkler system, and I usually, since I'm a gardener, I'm the last one to get my sprinklers blown out. This year, I had shoulder surgery. I didn't get quite as much done in my garden, and I just wanted to wrap up early. So I had my sprinklers winterized at the very beginning of the month, and so that locust tree wasn't getting that regular watering. Now, in all the years that we've lived here, over the past 17 years, that tree is has these beautiful golden leaves, and it's almost always like freakishly able to hang on to those leaves while all the other trees will be completely bare of leaves. This year, without the sprinkler system continuing to, you know, help support that tree with extra watering, those leaves dropped just like every other tree on the street. Does watering make that much of a difference for a tree being able to hold on to those leaves a little bit longer? Well, it does because water is one of the requirements for photosynthesis to occur. So it's it's water with carbon dioxide from the air in and in the presence of chlorophyll and sunlight, and that produces the sugars that uh, the tree uses as food. So if you no, know, if it was was a was the latter part of the summer really dry up in your area? Yes. Okay, so so that even then the heat itself and the water relations, a lot of plants will when when they undergo a water shortage, they will throw some of their foliage because the foliage can become somewhat of a liability because uh, it has to keep that foliage hydrated and if it gets into water relations problems, it'll tend to throw off some of the foliage so it doesn't have as much foliage to keep hydrated. Oh, interesting. But at the same token, by throwing the foliage, it also kind of decreases its its uh, sugar production because the foliage was important for photosynthesis. So in many ways, trees have to manage their finances in a manner similar that to to any human or a family. You you have inputs and outputs, but you have to regulate how you manage those inputs and outputs as the conditions change. So t- trees are actually quite a you know quite a bit like people. And so that's when we when we're always talking and trying to teach new arborists, it's it's all about this think of a tree's finances in the same way that you think of your own finances. Huh, interesting analogy. You know, I, I like that you mentioned earlier as well the role that daylight plays with trees and how they really take their cue from that. This explains why, you know, it can be, we can be having a lovely, lovely summer and those first indicator trees that the season is changing will start to turn their leaf color and people will have a reaction like, are you kidding me? It's still wonderful. You know, we're having a wonderful summer. It's, you know, warm and and gorgeous and it seems like there's plenty of sun, but trees are sensitive to that daytime, nighttime equation. Yeah, and that's, like I like I said, in a way, it's a little bit of a safeguarding. So if we would have an extended warm fall, and then it would suddenly turn cold, uh, that's when sometimes we can see some winter-related injury on trees. Uh, if the trees you know, what we would like to see is a kind of a gradual cool down uh, in the transition from fall into winter. And uh, if we when we get those extended warm periods, uh, some trees like uh, Norway maples will tend to even hang onto their foliage a little bit longer and it'll actually just almost become freeze dried. If there's a sudden temperature drop below freezing before the leaves would normally fall, uh, the leaves can almost become freeze-dried on the trees, and then they'll stick on the trees for 
uh, into the winter season a lot longer than they might normally do because of uh, the, the sudden temperature drop. So we, we really don't like to see that because we know we can see some, uh, it can cause some injury to the tree when we have these really rapid temperature swings in the fall or, or even in the spring when the trees begin to wake up and then a little bit earlier and then we get a real late spring cold snap. But as the weather people are telling us, as as climate change affects us, we're going to see uh, more of these wide temperature swings rather than fewer. How about just for the home gardener? heading out to look at their trees one last time, probably over the next couple of weeks before they settle in for winter, especially if they're in a, a colder climate. What would you tell them to look for in that final walkthrough? Well, one of the first things we always recommend is, does the tree have large deadwood in it? And when I say deadwood, I'm just talking about dead branches up in the tree because those are the ones that are most likely to fall. So if you have large dead limbs and they're located somewhere in a tree where if they broke off, they could fall on your home or on someone or on your car or the driveway. Those are some of the things that you really want to pay attention to because as that wood, uh, that as when branches die, which can be just a part of a normal tree's cycle, depending on, on a, some of the environmental factors around the tree, uh, eventually those the tree will shed those limbs. And the things that they could hit uh, potentially need to be considered, if you will. So whenever we see large deadwood in a tree, that's always a somewhat cause for concern depending on where it could fall. And so if it's around play equipment or in some part of the yard where you frequently are located, then you know our recommendation is to take that take that dead wood out of there because it's not really contributing to the tree anymore. And if it can, if the tree is located somewhere where it can fall and not hurt anything, uh, that's one thing. But if it's located in a part of the tree that can fail, that where it could fail and strike something or somebody, then we need to pay attention to that. So that's one thing to take a look at. Okay, what else? Well, the other thing is as the trees uh, begin to, uh, leaves begin to fall and we can see the structure of the tree, we're looking at branches that are weakly attached to the parent stem or whether it's the trunk or another large branch. And some trees can form uh, weakly attached branches. Uh, some of it is because of the differences between different tree species other times it can be how trees respond to wounds or maybe some previous damage. But when we see branches that are poorly attached, and these are some of the things that I talked about in the body language of trees, uh, those branches can be more prone to failing when they get a load placed on them. And that can be from a heavy snow load, or it can be from wind, or uh, especially ice. And even a quarter inch to a half an inch of, of ice uh, that begins to freeze on the branches will can cause uh, a lot of damage to trees. And usually it's those weak, weakly attached branches or trees that have what we call included bark, where the, it looks like they're, the two parts of the tree may be attached to each other, but they're actually not. Uh, they can pull apart. Uh, pretty easy under a under a heavy ice or snow load. So as arborists, we're always mm -hmm. looking at uh, the signs of of poorly attached branches or weakly attached branches or trees with multiple leaves. And sometimes we need to recommend removal of those branches uh, before they fail, or we may be able to cable them or do some other supporting material supporting type work in the tree that can uh, reduce but not eliminate. Uh, the chances of that branch or partial uh, part of the tree failing. When you're talking about tree failing, I managed to find a presentation that you gave called Why Trees Die. In your opinion, what are some of the major reasons why trees die? Well, tree, like we talked about, trees have to produce, they have to make their own food. Uh, and they, they 
the food they make is is actually just uh, very simple sugars. And then they make those sugars. It takes energy for them to do that. They make it from, you know, having enough uh, nutrients and then water and carbon dioxide from the air, and they make those sugars. And then the tree can store those sugars as starch, kind of like you would store them in a bank account, and or it can uh, use them, use that sugar to do useful work. And so the trees have several different processes in, that they, they carry on. They have to absorb water and nutrients from the soil. They have to transport those water and nutrients uh, from the root system up into the remaining parts of the tree. They have to carry on photosynthesis to produce the food. Uh, just like us, they carry on respiration where they burn that food and make things happen to do actual work. And the other things trees have to do is, is maintain their, their water relations, uh, and they do that by a process called transpiration. There's a constant flow of water from the root system up the tree and out through the leaves. And so when things start going wrong with any of those processes, the tree can begin to go into stress. And so a tree can't get up and move from one place to another. It's pretty much stuck where it's at. But the tree has to get larger each year. It has to put on a new set of leaves. So it has to keep growing, but typically as the tree gets larger, it begins to run out of resources. So you can kind of think if you draw an analogy to, to us, uh, it's like a company that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then all of a sudden gets too big and it isn't able to maintain itself. And then it has to uh, downsize. So mm. trees often have to downsize and they do that by shedding branches or dying back. But eventually, if the tree cannot produce enough food to keep itself or parts of its the, the entirety of the tree alive, it will it will die. It's kind of like drawing an analogy to us, uh, a person going bankrupt. Their their expenses exceed their assets, and trees don't have bankruptcy to file. When a tree goes bankrupt, it it dies. So essentially, you know, trees die because they 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 run out of resources to the point where they can no longer make enough food to support themselves. Yeah, well, and interestingly, you write that trees are committed to increasing their mass. So they've got a, a one-way ticket to getting bigger. That's their goal in life. Let's get bigger till they reach maturity. Yeah. But even when they get to that point, it can be too much for them. Yeah, because when it, when it, you know, I use the analogy, you know, what do we call a tree that doesn't put on a new set of leaves every year? You know, we call that tree dead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's, you know, people kind of get the, it, it comes back to how trees grow. They, they put on a new layer each year over the existing tree. So a tree is actually a series of, you, you use that, there's kind of like that analogy of a, of a child's uh, little block set with a little block, and then there's a bigger block that goes over it, and then a ah. bigger one, and a bigger one, and a bigger one. And, yeah, the nesting dolls. And that's dolls. essentially how a tree grows. It puts on a new growth ring on the outside and around all the branches, and then it puts out the new foliage. So what we see as green foliage every year is the most recent tree that the tree uh, puts this covering over itself. And and trees have the ability to shut them parts of themselves down. That's why many trees are hollow on the inside. They can actually shut the interior parts of themselves down because they're no longer functional in some of the day-to-day -day activities, but they become they can become still functional in the strength of the tree. So that's oftentimes why a, a hollow tree can actually be healthy. Oh, interesting. But structurally unsound. Okay. We always yeah. have to differentiate a tree's health from its structural stability. And that, you know, that throws a lot of people off because, yes. you know, a city arborist can say, you know, we need to take this tree down and people are looking at it. Well, it has green leaves. It looks great, mm. but it could be structurally unsound and prone to failure. When a large tree fails, 
or even part of a tree, uh, it can, it can, you know, it can cause death or uh, uh, severe, you know, damage. So it, it comes into the part of the risk assessment part of trees. So arborists are always looking at that, and it's our duty as an arborist to bring some of these things to the attention of the trees, either the homeowner or the property manager that is responsible for maintaining those trees. And sometimes we have to be the bearer of bad news. Yeah. We don't like to do that, but it's our responsibility as arborists. Well, and this is where sometimes homeowners can be a little dubious because they don't understand that dual track. They're looking at the green leaves. They're not thinking about structure so much. So That's, that's correct. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And that's why, you know, another thing that we would look at would be are there um, are there cavities on the tree? Are there hollows in the tree? Is there uh, a lot of dead bark or obvious decay on the tree on the main trunk of the tree? Because when you put wind loads on those on those structures, that decay is, is weak and it can cause a failure at that tree. And we've all seen pictures uh, with the recent storms of trees that have gone through houses. And, yeah. and everything else. And a lot of times an arborist can look at those images that they see on television and they can they can see why that tree failed. You, you give a big enough tree, there, no tree is free of risk. Every tree has some risk. And that's an important part. People always ask if we can make a tree safe. Well, you know, we can't make a tree totally safe because, you know, gravity will always win at some time in the, in the future. So, we categorize trees as low risk trees or or high or critical risk trees uh, as they compare to all other trees out there and we have uh, you know we receive training on how to uh, evaluate you know a tree structure and then looking at you know which way if the tree would fail which way might it fail might it strike a, a target either a building or a, or people and then what are the consequences if, if that tree would fail and strike uh, a target? You know, is it serious? Is it minor? It, it varies with the, with the situation. How do you feel about how people plant trees nowadays, where they're digging a hole, they're amending the soil, they put the tree in, they're, they're kind of burying the tree, and then they add these mounds of mulch over the tree? Well, I would start that by asking you a question. How many <laughs> times do we get to plant a tree? One time, just, that's just it. Just one time, yeah. right? Yeah. So the planting process is an incredibly important procedure to get that tree off on a proper lifestyle. So it's an incredibly important. That's why uh, when we talk to arborists and, and and we we always make this big to do about installing a tree properly. Uh, you know, take your time, get a quality tree that's free of defects. Uh, dig a wide planting hole. You'll see recommendations two to three times the diameter of either the ball or the container that it came in. Uh, make the hole very shallow so it's no deeper than the original soil line. And many trees come from the nursery uh, too deep in the balls. We're learning that, and it kind of comes with how trees are propagated. Uh, but, you know, the idea there's a, it just doesn't throw the tree in the in the ground. You can, you can help its longevity by uh, taking some precautions. It's, it's more than what we can really go over, you know, here, but there are plenty of good planting diagrams and recommendations on what to do and what not to do uh, on the internet. It's just extremely important to get a tree off uh, to a good, to a good start. And then of course, you know, mulching that tree uh, uh, properly and making sure it's watering. But yeah, one of the errors we commonly see are people piling mulch up around the, uh, the base of the tree. And uh, what that does is it tends to, uh, Mulch is a great place for tree roots to grow because they have oxygen, they have water, they have nutrients, uh, the, the texture is correct. And so roots want to form up in that mulch. And sometimes trees choose poorly in how they respond to things. And we can see a lot of sim 
girdling roots around that form around these young trees that uh, become problems 10, 12 years down uh, the line. Uh, Dr. Gary Johnson at the University of uh, Minnesota is one of the uh, primary uh, researchers in, in the identification and management of stem, what we call stem girdling roots up there at University of Minnesota. Great guy. Hmm. So, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were sharing this is how one of, I think, the most complicating issues that people have when they're trying to take care of their trees is that the root of problems with trees can be a decade or more old, but you don't realize it at the time. So it takes years for these things to make themselves kind of known to you. And by the time you see it, it's it might be too late. That's, you know, that's correct. And, you know, the problem with that is root systems are down underground and we can't see what's going on down there. It's even it's even difficult for arborists many times to assess uh, the condition of, of the root systems. Oftentimes, because if the root system begins to fail, the top part of the tree will generally follow. Or if there's a problem with the root system, it'll be reflected in the upper part of the tree because the upper part of the tree and the lower below ground portions of the tree are dependent on each other. The above ground part of the tree uh, creates the photosynthesis and, and the transpiration and produces the energy for the tree where the below ground produces the, the food and or produces the or absorbs the water and nutrients that the upper part needs to carry on photosynthesis. So if one part begins to fail, the other part tends to follow. So those trees that are doing very, very well are those where the connections, the, the, the root system, the above ground parts, and the connections between them are all functioning well, and the tree has plenty of resources. But anytime there's a problem with one part of the tree or the other, uh, the tree can enter a spiral of, of decline, and sometimes it can be very difficult or, or impossible to break the tree out of that, especially in its advanced, in its advanced stages. Yeah, I saw that in your presentation. You call it the decline spiral. What are some of the early warning signs that your tree is is beginning this spiral? A lot of times we'll see either reduced we'll see reduced growth. In other words, you know, we we can look and we can start seeing the tree not putting on, you know, as much uh, growth as it has in previous years. We can see smaller leaves. We can see uh, not as many leaves being produced. We can begin to see uh, dead twigs showing in the upper crown of the tree. Because oftentimes trees, when we talked about it before, they can make themselves smaller by shedding branches, but they usually shed branches on the lower parts of the tree. You know, some of the branches that are down in the shade and those that probably aren't as valuable in terms of photosynthesis, but Seeing a tree begin to die back from the top part of the tree, those leaves that are up in the sun and usually the produce uh, food with some of the highest efficiencies, when we see those things going, that's typically a sign that the tree isn't feeling so well. And then that's when the arborist tries to figure out, you know, what may be the problem. And typically it's going to be with, you know, either one of those five physiological processes in trees, absorption, translocation of materials up and down the tree, uh, transpiration, the movement of water up the tree, photosynthesis or respiration. Because if any of those processes begin to have a problem, it affects all the other processes as well. Hmm. What's the number one thing that people can do to stop a tree that's in that decline spiral? Is there one piece of advice you would give them? Well, one of the, it's, sometimes it's, it's kind of realizing where a tree, is, is the tree located in a situation where it's likely to run out of resources? And a lot of times we look at how much space, how much soil area does a tree have available to it? And if we, if we see trees that are going to be limited in, in soil space, 
sometimes we may want to look at the care of that tree and, you know, do some kind of artificial size reductions on that tree to keep it from outpacing its resources. Uh, the tree still has to put on new foliage every year, but by proper pruning, we can sometimes manage that balance. So uh, sometimes we don't want trees to get any bigger because we realize that if they do, they're going to outstrip their resources and then the trees will die back. So we do have some means of regulating tree size in a controlled manner so that we can kind of, you know, keep a handle on the resources that trees have avail you know available to them. So a lot of it kind of comes back to, you know, where is the situation the tree is is growing in. Uh, different things compete with trees. Uh, turf grass competes with trees for water and nutrients, and also the root systems of turf grasses can be very thick, and they compete for space with tree root systems. So oftentimes you'll hear arborists talk about properly mulching uh, trees in order to remove the grass and use an organic mulch like uh, uh, wood chips to replace the turf under the tree because the tree finds that environment much more similar to the woods than it is in a turf grass system. Planting trees in groups is is a good thing to do because trees do, it, it sounds funny, but they, they can communicate with each other through uh, their root systems and through the uh, relationships they create with soil fungi connecting the root systems of different trees together. It's uh, the, the soil biology, the soil food webs that form in soils is, is, a, is a very uh, interesting, and we're just learning more and more about these relationships that different plants make with each other. So um, watering trees properly, pruning them properly, not damaging them by uh, cutting the roots off or uh, pruning improperly or uh, doing other things that can adversely affect those five important principles, absorption, translocation, photosynthesis, respiration, and transpiration. Um, okay. Looking at when you plant a tree, making sure uh, you plant a tree that needs a lot of sun in a sunny area, uh, because if you plant a tree like that in shade, you know, it's, it's going to have issues, uh, especially as it gets larger. So a lot of things to do, but oftentimes they're site dependent. Yes. Well, let's tackle some common questions. I, I asked listeners to submit questions knowing that I would have a tree expert at my disposal today. So let's see what you think of these. The first one has to do with boulevard trees. Common issues that you see with boulevard trees would be that they just don't get man maintained. They weren't pl planted by the homeowner. Sometimes boulevard trees are the only tree in the front yard. And uh, this question has to do with a boulevard tree that was not maintained and the tree kind of turned into a shrub, uh, was just allowed to go crazy, basically. And then a new homeowner bought the home and came through and pruned that tree, obviously pretty severely on the lower half to get it to look like a tree again. How does that stress impact the tree? Can the tree expect to go on and, and live a full life or does that initial uh, crazy period that it went through where it was just allowed to go crazy with all these lower limbs and suckers, does that impact the longevity of the tree? Well, that gets back to my comments that, that trees oftentimes uh, do things that uh, aren't in their own best interests. And just like a young child that isn't disciplined properly or brought up correctly can form, you know, a lot of bad habits that can be difficult to correct later on. Trees do the same thing. And remember, if it's a boulevard, what, what, when I hear boulevard tree, which to me means a tree on the outside of the sidewalk or on the public right-of-way, uh, that's actually owned by the, the village. It's a, it's a village tree. 
And of course, different communities look at trees a little bit differently. Uh, some have, some municipalities have city foresters that kind of keep an idea on that, that look at the trees and, you know, set up proper pruning cycles and cull trees that, that form, you know, bad habits and need to be removed and replaced. But other villages pretty much just let things go the way they go. So it, without actually seeing, you know, the particular tree, it's very difficult to kind of assess uh, how the, the person that came in and pruned the tree, did they, did they know what they were doing and, you know, prune in such a way that actually made an improvement to an undisciplined tree or did they use some poor pruning tactics that may actually make the situation, you know, worse. So, um, and, and sometimes trees, they, they form their bad habits are such that it can be practically uh, impossible to correct, to correct them by additional pruning. Sometimes you just look at a tree and say, you know, this one just needs to come out and we need to start over. So it's kind of hard to tell just from that particular description on what the tree looked like before it was pruned and what it looked like after it was pruned. Mm -hmm. But trees will respond, and if the tree has the resources, it will continue to grow, but will it grow in a the manner that we want it to grow in? That's always the question. Hmm. So you can have some bad actors in the in the tree department that just kind of you can you can have some bad actors you can yeah. have some poor performers and some you know some good performers and hmm. you know a lot of trees that are selected for um, you know municipal type plantings are are they relatively they grow relatively quickly so uh, nursery doesn't take a long time to produce them that reduces the cost they tend to transplant well and that's why in many cases we end up with uh, most of our city or public owned trees tend to be a very few species. And of course that can turn into problems like we're seeing now with the ash trees. Yes. Ash was a very popular street tree, but now with the, um, the emerald ash borer, um, many villages are getting hit pretty hard because they're, they're losing a large percentage of their street trees. Yes. This next question has to do with things we do to protect the trees or attempt to protect our trees during the winter months. This one listener was writing in about whether or not they should wrap the bark on their tree. Their neighbor always does it. They never do, but they feel like they should. They just don't know why they would do it. And the other has to do with putting burlap around trees like arborvitae. Well, the... We generally don't recommend, you know, wrapping trees. And when you think about it, you know, the idea is, well, you know, what's it supposed to do? It, it really, on a on a thin bark on a thin bark tree, the temperature on the outside of the wrap is going to be essentially no different than on the inside of the wrap uh, because it's, you know, it's so tightened down. So, so generally, we don't, uh, you know, we don't recommend that. The wraps, the researchers that have looked at this. Uh, tend to say, you know, it really doesn't do any good. So uh, rather than wrapping the trunks, uh, probably not such a good idea. Now, sometimes you may say, well, what about if I have a lot of deer in my area? You know, and, you know, should I wrap the trunks to help prevent from the deers from rubbing their antlers on the tree? And the wrap may help a little bit, but, you know, if the deer is rubbing it, it would probably rub through the wrap pretty, pretty quickly, too. In a situation like that, you're better off with just wrapping some type of uh, chicken wire or something around the tree so they physically can't get at it. Now, wrapping um, some types of conifers, that can help simply, like for arborvite, I know down in where I used to live, uh, you know, people would wrap arborvites just to keep the deer from eating the foliage over the winter because deer love arborvites. Some people wrap the conifers to reduce the risk of, of winter desiccation or winter burn, which is the loss of water during the winter time, uh, that can end up causing uh, the trees to brown out the following spring. And, you know, that can be done for aesthetic reasons, although typically the trees kind of grow through that. And a lot of that depends on the type of winter that 
that we have. But uh, generally, you know, wrapping the trunks isn't typically recommended anymore uh, unless for special circumstances. Sometimes wrapping conifers, uh, say that were planted in the fall and maybe haven't formed a good root system, it may reduce their likelihood of, of burning over the winter. So that may be a worthwhile uh, procedure, but you, a lot of it depends on the type of winter weather we get and you know who can sometimes predict that. Hmm. Speaking of brownout on arborvitae with that winter burn, do they recover from that or is it or should we be quicker to act on that when we see it in the spring? Well, winter burn winter burn often is is caused by you know, there's there's a couple types of desiccation that can that can happen. Uh, one is just from the foliage drying out. Uh, if the ground is frozen hard and you get a lot of desiccating winds, uh, because conifers really, they, they can maintain photosynthesis all winter if they don't have the water. A lot of that tissue can turn brown. It just desiccates, and the cells can dry out and freeze, and then they turn brown typically as the spring weather warms. But if, as long as there are still buds below the brown spot, uh, just like you pinch a, a, a flowering plant to make it branch more, as long as you, it doesn't freeze back too far and eliminate all the growth points and the tree has enough uh, strength in its root system to put out a new flush of growth, uh, some of that brown foliage oftentimes drops or is covered up with the new flush of growth the following spring. So a lot of times they can look pretty bad in the spring, but they tend to improve over the winter as or over the the following growing season is the new growth, fresh green growth covers up some of that brown stuff. And a lot of times the brown stuff kind of dries up and drops off um, as well. So some of that answer comes back to, you know, the health of the plant as it comes out and how severe the burning may have been. Hmm. This question has to do... It's always a gray area. It's never black and white. It's always a gray area. Okay. This next question has to do with injections for things like emerald ash borer. Do you okay. advise doing that? Do you tell homeowners that they should do that? Should they try to attempt to save their ash trees? Well, that's up. First of all, that's up to the, you know, the homeowner. Uh, we know that once emerald ash borer moves into an area, if you do nothing, your ash tree will, will get the borer and, and it will die. Uh, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much a given. You're not going to get lucky and your tree is going to escape just by, by luck. Emerald ash borer finds every particular tree. So we can protect ash trees. The first thing is to, is to look at the tree and say, is it, is it a valuable tree in terms of how it's, you know, is it's, how it's functioning? Uh, there are a lot of really junky ash trees out there that probably aren't worth um, investing in to uh, save them. And so even a lot of villages will go through and they will start taking out uh, their their poor quality ash trees in advance. And if they decide to treat, it'll be the trees that are in better shape. So that's always the first uh, recommendation. And then the next recommendation you have is to, well, if I want to treat the tree, uh, what material can I use? And some materials are available uh, to the homeowner uh, over the counter, some of the soil applied materials, and, and those materials don't need to be trunk injected. Uh, there are other materials that are only available to uh, licensed pest control operators or, or applicators. And those products, however, tend, they include emamectin benzoate, which is the product that probably does the best job of protecting an ash tree with a single application. And it, and it can only be applied as a trunk injection. There isn't any other, uh, it doesn't have any soil activity. So it has to be injected directly into the trunk. So for a for a problem that is a terminal problem, and that's what emerald ash borer is, uh, then we can tend to justify the 
uh, injection procedure as a valid you know procedure i might have a, i might have a little different aspect on injecting trees simply just to fertilize them if i could fertilize the tree uh via the soil method so I don't have to damage because when we do inject a tree we do make a wound. You can't get around that. So just like with human treatments, sometimes you know a cancer patient has to undergo chemotherapy and they'd rather not do that, but the option for not doing it is is going to be worse than actually, you know, going through the treatment. And you said you you do have to make a little what? You have to make a wound? Oh, a wound. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, like I said, trees don't, trees can't heal wounds. They can only seal them off. So when we drill a hole in a tree or even some of the other techniques, uh, there's, there's typically some type of wounding you're doing to the the tree in that process. Hmm. And so we have to take that wound into, you know, consideration. Uh, Do we have options? in the, in the case of emerald ash borer, it seems that the chemical that, that the insecticide that works the best to protect the tree is only available, it's only deliverable into the tree as a trunk injection. And, and that is a one and done. If you do it one time, your tree is good? Uh, it's usually recommended to be done every every two to three years. Okay. So that injection is done... In other words, you know, I know when we were doing it, the manufacturer recommends doing the injections once every two years. There's a lot of factors uh, with a particular tree that can affect how long or how well the material can be distributed in the tree. Mm-hmm. So there may be some research that say, well, it, in the best scenario, it might last three years, perhaps even more. But you know, sometimes we don't have the best scenario. So the recommendation is to do those trunk injections. With the active ingredient, emomectin benzoate, uh, we do those um, recommended as once every two years. Although, you know, some practitioners will go once every three, but the manufacturer kind of recommends once every two. Okay. Here's another question. It's kind of along these lines. This is from Michelle. She says, I have a question regarding treatment of trees for disease or infestation. Is there a general rule of thumb when to treat? Versus when to let nature take its course and just replace the tree? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, once again, it kind of depends on like, what disease of what tree are we talking about. Some diseases are some diseases are killers, like Dutch elm disease. You know, if a if a elm tree gets Dutch elm disease and it isn't attended to quickly, where the disease is recognized, that will kill the tree. So other diseases are more or less aesthetic. In other words, they may not necessarily hurt the tree seriously from a health standpoint, but it can make the tree look bad or not look nice. And and sometimes, you know, homeowners will object to how their trees look. They want their property to look nice. And if they've got this really cruddy looking tree in the front yard, they may say, well, is there something I can do so it won't get that way? So, as far as pest management goes, we need to we need to properly identify the plant and the disease because certain diseases need to be treated in in certain times of the year or in certain methods. So uh, many times, you know, it can be a choice to the homeowner: uh, do we let nature take its course, or perhaps I would like to treat the tree so it it doesn't look as bad as it would otherwise. Sometimes we, we go and say, well, if we keep letting this disease have at this tree every year, uh, your tree may just, it can be one of those factors that can affect photosynthesis or transpiration or translocation, and that can be one of the factors that is contributing to the decline spiral of the tree. And if we can treat the disease or treat the insect infestation, either one, Uh, does that give the tree a better chance of rather than not doing anything? Mm. So those are things uh, in a manner, uh, in a similar manner to talking to your physician. Uh, You know, do I treat this? Uh, Do I just put up with it? Do I, uh, or or just let nature take its course? It's it's kind of a similar 
situation that you that you have to discuss with your arbors. Yeah. Now, here's another question. This one's about pine trees. Joan writes, all of my pine trees' inner needles all turn brown this summer and look dead. Why, and will the tree come back? Well, remember when I talked about, uh, you know, a lot of trees, if they come under stress, they will throw some of their leaves. Yep. Conifers can do the Conifers can do the same thing. If if they get really stressed out in droughty periods, well, they'll tend to drop their inside leaves. Now, now conifers will drop a portion of their needles uh, every year, usually in the fall. We call that fall needle cast. So sometimes during a real droughty summer, the tree will begin to throw those interior needles sooner than they would otherwise if they had better growing conditions. But if when they drop the inside needles, that isn't necessarily a cause for alarm because most conifers uh, do that. Anytime most conifers are full sun plants, there are a couple of exceptions to that. But most of them, most of your pines, your spruces, your Douglas firs, your, your tree firs, uh, if they're growing in shade, they tend to throw a lot more needles than they would otherwise. The problem sometimes shows up as if, especially on older, weaker branches, they can lose so many needles that there aren't enough needles left on the branch, and then the tree will shut that entire branch down. In other words, it'll the tree will just tell that branch to die on its own. So a lot of times we'll see that in large conifers uh, we'll oftentimes see the bottom branches beginning to thin and die, and that's somewhat built into a into a conifer's growth pattern because when they grow in the shade, they tend to drop branches that grow in the shade tend to be dropped mm-hmm. over time. So the the question it kind of comes to well, how much of the tree is is doing that, and how much foliage is still remaining on the individual branches. And there are uh, other diseases of pine. There are several needle cast diseases that have really long, complicated names, and they seem to be becoming worse in recent years because of our wet spring weather. And they can contribute to more needle loss in conifers. And if a conifer loses so many needles, it typically can't produce the energy to keep itself alive, and then those trees have an increased risk of of, of dying, uh, oftentimes over the winter. Okay. So again, it's got this huge mass to maintain, and then on top of all of that, it's losing or it's shedding too many needles, and it just can't recover. Uh, that's right. You know, as a, you have to think of the needles and the foliage as the ability of the tree it, it, it kind of goes back to the tree's ability to produce food. Yeah. So if you take off half the needles of a tree, you've just in, decreased its ability to create food by half. It would be similar to putting you on a half rations diet. Mm. Okay, because you know that all the food the tree makes is is produced through the foliage, and if the if the the tree will you know, if it, if it has to, it'll try to reduce the amount of needles that it has to support. But at the same time, that's you know that's not that's not good for the tree. The tree may have to be forced to do that. And that's kind of how the tree prioritizes resources. Uh, trees prioritize resources just like we tend to prioritize resources. And if a tree doesn't prioritize things properly, it can get into trouble. Uh, kind of similar to the person that wins the lottery and has no financial uh, um, training and blows all their money, even though they had a bunch of it because they (laughs) invested poorly and didn't spend it. That's a great analogy. Here's another question. This one's about an oak. There are two questions here. Ask why, uh, this is from Kelly. She says, ask why my oak tree's leaves are wilty and have little bumps all over the bottom. This is during the summer. Was the first part, why are they wilty? Yeah. 
and then they have little bumps all over the bottom. And then the other question well, the, the, is, why does my oak tree hang on to its leaves all winter long and then drop them in the spring? Okay. Well, let's go to the bumps on the leaves. Those are, those are most likely galls. Uh, and oaks have hundreds of different species of, of galls. Most of them are caused by insects or mites. And it's, it's, it's almost like a little, uh, it's actually plant tissue, but it's almost like a little, uh, a, a little wart or so that uh, is, is initiated to form either by the insect or mite uh, laying eggs in the leaf or the feeding of the insect or mite causing uh, the genes to kind of go haywire and create this little glob of plant tissue that either the mite or the insect, uh, in an, or in some cases diseases, feed off of during their development. Okay. So the uh, uh, the, the bump is, and, and they all have, uh, many of them are common enough to have common names uh, like jumping oak gall or, or uh, Wool sour gall, some form on leaves, some are on form on twigs, but there's there's a there's a whole bunch of them, kind of depending on what their appearance looks like. Generally, on the leaves, they're not really harmful uh, because they don't impact the tree to the extent where it becomes a real liability for the tree. Some of the galls that form on twigs, especially when the trees are are young, can kind of cause some twig dieback or some deformities, but the tree usually grows out of them later on. Okay. Now, why the leaves are wilty, that could be a water relations problem. Sometimes trees can, uh, oak trees can get several different diseases in the spring. They can get anthracnose in the spring. There's another disease called burr oak. I'm not sure what kind of an oak it is. Okay. I don't know if you said She didn't burr say. Oak, but, okay, so... Burr oak blight is a is a disease that's affecting oak leaves that can make them turn brown and look wilty during uh, the growing season. So it could be that, or it could be that the you know, trees kind of can can wilt a little bit if they get into very dry soil conditions. Okay, uh, but they usually come back then if they get rain or you you water them. And what was the what was the last part of that? Why the oak tree hangs on to its leaves all winter long and then drops it in the spring? Well, that could either be a function of the type of oak tree that it is. For example, pin oaks and red oaks will hold on to their leaves during the wintertime. They kind of turn brown and hang on, and then they drop in the spring, where other types of oaks like uh, uh, white oaks and normally uh, burr oaks will drop their leaves in the fall, and they don't hang on to their leaves. Now, burr oak blight that gets on burr oaks, one of the symptoms of that disease are uh, oak leaves kind of hanging on in clumps up in the upper portions of the trees. So without knowing what type of oak tree we're actually talking about, Mm -hmm. um, it it could be either just a natural process about how that particular oak does compared to other species of oaks, or it could be an issue with the Uh, a disease, or sometimes trees that that have their root systems damaged and and show um, what we call construction injury from construction or people messing around with their root systems, oftentimes during the construction of houses, those uh, trees will hold on to their leaves too, which wouldn't be a natural process, but they're doing that because of uh, health issues. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So knowing the type of oak is really important when you're asking a question about, well, probably any type of tree. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people don't, you know, they they don't really know what kind of trees they have on their property. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, that can be an issue when we're trying to diagnose these things on the phone. You know, the, 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 the person will say, well, I have this tree and it's doing this. Do you know, <laughs> we know what kind of tree it is? No, I, I don't really know. Well, that makes it a little difficult for me to... Uh, uh, you know, kind of weed out what the possibilities are if I don't know what kind of tree I'm talking about. Hmm. 
Well, this last question is from Laura. She had two trees that died. We'll cover them one at a time. One is a river birch that died, and the other is a maple. So she said, we have a maple tree that died, and now our river birch is dying. Is it soil quality, root rot, soil compaction? We have a neighbor that has had lots of trees die. I thought trees were hardier than that. And she added a few more pieces of information. She said, the birch was here when we moved in, so it's about 13 years old. This spring, we noticed that two of the three trunks on the tree were not growing leaves, and we could snap the branches off. The autumn blaze maple was planted in 2010, and it was completely dead by last fall, so fall of 2016. Mulch is around each tree. I've heard about the roots getting tangled. Maybe we should get our soil tested. And we didn't amend the soil when we planted these this maple tree. The hole was a good size, but we didn't put mulch too close to it, just loosely around it, and we used dyed mulch. What kind of mulch? Dyed okay. wood mulch, yep. Okay. Well, the first question I would have is, you said 13 years, so we may be talking about a new subdivision, uh, You know, somebody that moved into a relatively newer home. As we know, when we watch new subdivisions going in, uh, oftentimes the, 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 one of the greatest problems facing urban trees is soil compaction. Uh, because especially with the equipment they use when they build subdivisions now, they scrape all the soil, they really compact it so the buildings stand up, Okay. and then they just use a little bit of topsoil over the top, and those conditions oftentimes are not very good for growing uh, quality uh, trees. Yeah. And it really comes down just to poor quality soil and that affecting the, the, the resources that trees have, you know, available. Now, the birch tree... I got the idea. It sounds like it's a, a multi-trunked birch tree. Yeah. And that's pretty common uh, here in the Midwest. And I've, I've talked to um, nurserymen and other places that just say, you know, that seems to be, we oftentimes don't, and, and what those clump trees are, they're actually three individual trees that are planted by the, uh, the nurseries in the same planting hole. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, oftentimes that's the case. So it's three individual trees, and they put them in the same planting hole. And as the trees grow, oftentimes we see problems because those trunks will begin to grow into each other, and they begin to uh, compress against each other. And the root systems of those three trees will grow and get all tangled up. So, you know, I I, I usually do not recommend, and, and birch is a very common tree species that is grown in that manner. Uh, and I usually recommend, you know, don't buy a clump form of birch by a single trunk tree because growing them in clumps can oftentimes you'll see problems develop later on down the road because of how those trees have to compete with each other growing in essentially the same place. Uh, oftentimes one of the you know three or four leads, it, it becomes dominant over the others, and then the other leads just kind of fade away and die and have to be removed at a later point. They look great when they're small, yeah. but they oftentimes run into problems as they mature. Hmm. Interesting. Now, going back to the maple, um, it sounds like it was planted and the tree just didn't take off. Um, and that could be a problem. It, you know, it could have gone back with, you know, how the tree was planted. Uh, it may have had some problem in the nursery that the, the homeowner wasn't even aware of, aware of because it came that way uh, from the nursery. I'm not sure if the client planted, if, you, if, you're, if your caller planted the tree or if a, a landscaper planted the tree, but it just sounds like the tree didn't, didn't take off. Depending on the size of the tree, in, in, in our part of the mid, the upper Midwest here, uh, a three-inch diameter tree can actually take at least three years for the root system to grow back to the same size it was when the tree was dug in the nursery. It's about one year per caliper inch. 
And, and so uh, a larger tree, depending on how large, and smaller trees, we actually recommend them because they get over the transplanting process sooner than larger diameter trees and will actually, the smaller tree will catch up to the larger tree because it, it takes off faster. And so its growth in succeeding years outpaces uh, the larger size tree. I don't know, perhaps, um, they mulched it, which is usually a good, you know, a good thing to do. Uh, my guess is that, uh, you know, it, it, it may have had some issues in planting where the soil was so poor that it couldn't penetrate out into the surrounding soils. Uh, that, that's usually what happens when we have a tree that tends to fail fairly shortly after it was planted. Okay, so it's really more about what's going on below ground. Yeah, sometimes, oftentimes it, oftentimes it is, uh, and that's that's assuming you know there weren't you know there wasn't any trunk damage or something else. Once again, it, it's kind of hard to when, when you when you don't have a photograph or something to work up, you're yes. just kind of speculating. Yeah, um, sometimes we can kind of tell. Uh, if we saw the new growth increments on that tree, because usually in the nursery, the trees grow quite a bit because the soil is good. That's why it's a nursery in the first place. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're usually fertilized and cared for pretty heavily because it's a saleable product. But then once the tree can get in the landscape, oftentimes we see uh, a, a dramatic growth reduction for the first year after the tree is planted. And then it gradually tends to increase. The growth increments tend to increase as the tree adapts to its new home. But if it doesn't adapt, oftentimes we see the growth increments remaining stunted for a period of years. So a, a knowledgeable arborist could look at the tree and kind of tell a story on what may have happened with this tree over the past, uh, during the time frame after it was planted, that could give a pretty good indication that if the issue was soil-related uh, or something to have to do with the actual transplanting process. That's kind of like a detective story, you know. You know. In a way. Yeah, it is kind of like a detective story. And you have to do probably a lot of questioning when you get with a homeowner to try to understand the site a little bit and the history. That's correct. Let's wrap this up with one final question, and that is any other pieces of advice for people as they head into, you know, the winter months here with their trees? Well, remember that your tree is a living thing. And it has needs and it has wants and treat it in a, in a way similar that you would, you know, treat yourself, uh, you know, pay attention to those needs, uh, understand those wants and, and try to find out a little bit more about how your tree actually uh, grows and the things that it, the things that it needs. Uh, by doing that, oftentimes we can, uh, be proactive rather than reactive because with trees oftentimes being reactive isn't a good thing because trees get, can get into problems uh, it, over time and it can take time for them to get back out of the problems that they were in. So being attentive to the needs of the trees before things happen uh, is, is always a good idea. And that's why we always recommend that if you really care for your trees, uh, contact a, a certified arborist to have them come out and, and look at your trees and give them a, an appraisal of their of their health and, and maybe some of their needs uh, because it can be a, a very important part. Uh, a lot of your landscape value is tied up in your trees, and uh, a lot of people don't don't realize that. So your trees can become an asset or a liability uh, depending on their state of care. Hmm. So get to know your trees, identify your trees. And take care of them by getting a professional to swing by and give you kind of an overview of the state of their health. That's right. All right. Well, Rex, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us and doing this deep dive on trees today. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Since I'm going to be retiring, the best way to do it be to contact either the Davy Tree Expert Company office uh, in their area or the care of trees office in their area depending on what part of the country they are so at least getting in contact with my with my company that would be the the best way to do that 
That sounds wonderful. Well, Rex, thank you so much for being on the show today. Okay. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, that's it for our show today featuring Master Arborist Rex Bastian. I hope today's show makes you feel even more equipped to care for these gentle giants in our gardens. Just a reminder, I'll have all of the generous information that Rex shared on the show today under the Still Growing podcast page over at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. I'm so thankful to my team over at Podfly Productions, my editor and project manager, Eric Begay, and my copywriter, Ein Kadina. I'd also like to recognize the women who make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois, and she works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm and one of the finest companies in horticultural service. And Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan, Deb Gibson, and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager of American Beauty's Native Plants. And she was featured in episode 553, where we talked about incorporating more native plants into your garden. I sign off today with this question. Who are the gentle giants in your garden that need your care and attention? I'd like to suggest that you start by identifying every tree in your care and then spend some time getting to know them better this year, their strengths and their opportunities. Consider having an arborist come to your garden and profile your trees. We can all do better when it comes to taking care of the gentle giants in our gardens. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 